I can't believe it, this is not a drill, it's finally happening. By the King's most excellent majesty, and with the consent of the Lord's spiritual and temporal apparently, the Rentes Brackets Reform Bill has been introduced to Parliament. This is big, huge, and it's been reported as amazing news for renters, and doom for landlords. But is it? Let's dive in. Because I'm a landlord, but I also choose to rent, I've got a unique perspective on this. One that'll probably annoy everyone by not going far enough in either direction. So having done my best to hack through the 89 pages of legal jargon, I'll share what it actually says to the best of my understanding and what I think about it. You do just need to be aware that this is early. There are many opportunities for this to be debated and amended before it becomes law. And I'll talk about the likely timings of it coming into effect later on. So first up, no, no fault evictions. No, 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 no. This is the big one, and it actually goes deeper than it first appears, because now all tenancies will be issued on a month-to-month -month rolling basis from the start, no fixed terms at all, and the tenancy will continue until either the landlord or the tenant takes action to end it. If the tenant wants to end it, they can do so with two months' notice at any time, including on day one. This seems crazy to me, and no one would have objected if there was a six-month tie-in, but there you go. The government was also told by a cross-party committee that they should allow student tenancies to run for a fixed term, but they haven't. So the tenant can end the tenancy with two months notice at any time. But what about if the landlord wants to? Well, there has to be a reason. That's the whole thing about getting rid of no-fault evictions. There's got to be a valid reason. And these reasons are getting a big overhaul, but there are four big ones. The first two relate to the behaviour of the tenant. The first is rent arrears, and there are a few ways that this could be triggered, including a new mandatory one for persistent late payment if a tenant goes into two months of arrears on three separate occasions. I believe that other than this new persistent arrears ground, the only other situation where a judge must grant possession is where there are more than two months of arrears, both on the days of submitting the notice and on the day of the court hearing. The second tenant-related reason is to do with antisocial behaviour, where the notice period has been shortened and the language has been changed. So this is one of the areas where the government is presenting this as protecting landlords. But what's going to concern landlords and their kind of big objection to this whole thing is that there's no longer any kind of shortcut that avoids court, which campaigners won't say, but is actually a big reason that no-fault evictions are used today. It's just quicker and easier than going through a process that can take months or years if you take it to court. This is something that a cross-party select committee was very focused on when they reviewed a previous government white paper. They said that the government should reform this area of the courts before doing away with no-fault evictions. Now, they haven't done that, but they do say in the accompanying guidance that they will align the abolition with court improvements, including digitization of the process and prioritization of certain cases. Will this happen at all? Will it really be simultaneous? Will it be enough to satisfy landlords? We'll see. So in a minute, we'll come to rent increases. That's another really interesting area of this. But first, there are also two circumstances about ending a tenancy that the landlord can use based on their own circumstances which is that they want to sell the property or that they or their family want to move in. These reasons can't be used in the first six months of a tenancy and they have to give two months notice. There's also a ban on remarketing the property to let within three months of using one of these reasons, which is designed as a pretty weak protection against these being abused. This is an area where, if you ask me, it would have been so easy to do more to protect tenants' interest because it's really not their fault in any way if the landlord has a change of plans. And I don't think it's unreasonable to be given, say, four months notice of having to make a big change and uproot your whole family. And I also don't think it'd be unreasonable to say you couldn't do this within the first year of a tenancy. Because it doesn't seem right to me that someone might move in, go through all that hassle and aggravation, and then after six months be told, oh, actually, I want to move in, and they have to get out with two months notice. But there you go, that's how it's written. Okay, so you've now got a situation where a tenancy just goes on forever unless someone takes one of these valid actions to end it. So how will rent increases work then? Because often it's at the end of a fixed term at the moment that rent increases are discussed. I'll explain, but as I said, this bill will be amended as it goes through the process. So do make sure you subscribe to the channel because we'll be doing more videos like this to update you. Okay, rent increases. 
So rents will now only be able to be increased for once per year and two months notice have to be given. Landlords will need to use a particular form that hasn't been published yet and any rent review clause that's in the tenancy agreement will be invalid. When the tenant receives this notice, if they believe that the new amount is above the market rate, they can then take it to a tribunal to appeal it. The idea is that this prevents landlords from using this as a backdoor way to get people out by saying, your rent is now $1 million and they can't possibly pay it. But I'm still not clear on what would happen if the rent increase is valid, but the tenant can't pay it. They should in principle go, oh, well, I can't afford it, so I'll give notice and leave. But I can't see anything to stop them from continuing to pay the existing rent. And the landlord can't start legal action until the amount that they haven't been paying has built up to at least eight weeks worth of the new rent. But I might have missed something here. We'll come to some of the consequences of this because even though none of this is going to become law for a while, I do think we'll start to see some impact immediately. But before we get to that, there are a couple of other big changes to cover. One is a new redress scheme. So the bill creates a new ombudsman, which all landlords have to sign up for. Landlords will have to pay for this. It's not clear how, but they can't use it to complain about tenants. Tenants won't pay for it, but they can use it to complain about landlords. The ombudsman can force the landlord to remedy a problem, pay compensation, or order them to apologize. But whether they'll check if you've got your fingers crossed behind your back is not specified in the current version of the bill. Now, some kind of redress is something that I see the need for, but I think landlords can rightfully feel a bit aggrieved that they've now got yet another thing to pay for on top of things like landlord licensing, which only exists to enforce against them, and yet they have very limited options if there's a tenant causing problems. We're getting towards the end of the 89 pages now, but the bill also talks about the new landlord database, which all landlords and properties must appear on before they can be marketed to let. I think the idea is that tenants can know before committing to the tenancy whether the landlord has got any historic issues, which seems reasonable. I haven't had a chance to dig into this much, but I wouldn't be shocked if this is yet another thing that landlords will be expected to pay for. And of course, many will feel that there should also be a database of problem tenants. And then there's pets. Gerbils of the world rejoice because the bill says that landlords can't unreasonably withhold consent if a tenant asks to keep a pet. But they can insist on pet insurance being paid for by the tenant. What does reasonable mean in practice? I have no idea at the moment. But my main takeaway is that the definition of a pet includes an animal kept for ornamental purposes. So what happens from here? As I've said, there's a long way to go and lots of opportunities for the bill to be amended. So do sign up for our free weekly newsletter, Property Pulse, you'll find a link in the description where we'll be updating you as soon as anything happens. But the government does seem to be in a rush with this. The second reading is happening today as I record this, only the day after the bill was introduced, whereas the convention is for two weeks to pass between the first and second reading. It also means that ministers today will be pretty much debating a press release because the bill only came out yesterday and it's not exactly easy to interpret in its current form. I think the most likely outcome is that it'll become law in early 2024, with a date six months after that when new tenancies will start being of this new type. There will then be a second date when existing tenancies are automatically converted, which will probably be 12 months after that. So what will all this mean for both landlords and tenants? Well. Landlords won't like me saying this, but they have a habit of working themselves up into a tizzy about supposedly world-ending changes that turn out to be a complete non-issue. One recent example was the banning of charging fees to tenants, which was supposed to result in Armageddon, but in fact just made the system fairer with almost no noticeable ill effects. So given that these are big and significant changes, I'm sure many landlords will take this as their cue to sell up and get out of the sector, so it'll be a bumper capital gains tax year for the government. If they do, then who cares? their homes don't vanish, so they'll either be taken up by another landlord who is happy to operate under the new rules, or by someone who otherwise would have been renting. But more concerning, I think, is the amount of time that's going to elapse between now and no-fault evictions actually being banned. I imagine that we're going to see a flurry of no-fault evictions being issued starting now, because if you're even slightly concerned about your tenant's behaviour or ability to pay, it would seem logical to get them out now while you still can. And the same applies to rent increases too. It's also unfortunate that this has ended up finally happening at a time when rental properties are in short supply, so landlords have the upper hand. A natural consequence of it being harder to remove tenants is that landlords will be more picky about who they take on. So I do think applicants can expect to be put through the ringer even more than they currently are, which in some cases is a lot. 
But I mentioned a few times that a cross-party committee has already criticised the government's plans and suggested amendments, some of which have made it into the bill, but many haven't. So if you want to see in advance what amendments are likely to be made before it becomes law, then that's a document to look at. So keep watching this video where I explain what suggestions have been made and how likely they are to actually happen.